Secretariat for supporting the work of the panel. Thank you. Justin, Dai Hong. Questions. First question, the Honourable Kuang Chen Yu. Thank you, President. Last month, the media exposed that the MTRCL discovered in 2013 that two viaduct piers of the Yunlong section of West Rail showed subsidence of up to 20 millimeters, allegedly due to the construction works nearby. The MTRCL had forthwith informed the building's department but had not made the incident public. In this connection, will the government inform this council, one of the relevant government departments and policy bureaus, which BD informed after learning of the subsidence of the viaduct piers? The follow-up actions taken by such departments and bureaus and the reasons for not making public the incident. Two, given that BD and the MTRCL had learnt of the subsidence of the viaduct piers as early as in 2013, why the remedial works did not commence until last year? And three, of the mechanism in place for dealing with similar railway works problems in future. The Secretary for Transport and Housing. President, regarding the various parts of the question asked by Honorable Kong Chen Yu, the following is my consolidated reply in consultation with the Development Bureau. The government always accords top priority to railway safety and has put in place a stringent regulatory system. The EMSD regulates and monitors the safe operation of our railway system according to the Mass Transit Railway Ordinance and its subsidiary regulations. The Buildings Department regulates the planning, design and construction of buildings and associated works on private land to prescribe building safety standards according to the Buildings Ordinance. To safeguard the safety of railway structures, construction works look that are included within railway protection areas as stipulated under Schedule 5 of the BO should comply with a more stringent set of standards. BD requires registered building professionals to monitor the effect arising from the building works on adjacent railway structures according to the requirements set out in the BO and its subsidiary regulations. And the practice looked for authorized persons, registered structural engineers and registered geotechnical engineers or PNAP. Comments on an agreement to the MTRCL have to be sought for the plans of the proposed works and the monitoring proposal. Registered building professionals are also required to inform MTRCL direct before the commencement of any building works to enable the formulation of appropriate monitoring plans. As for the MTRCL, its dedicated railway protection team monitors the status of various railway facilities in accordance with a set of stringent railway protection measures and procedures, including regular machinery inspection of railway structures to ensure that the track is always maintained in a safe and sound condition. The contractor responsible for the works is also required to set up additional monitoring checkpoints at appropriate locations to assist the MTRCL to monitor the situation. If there are any irregularities, the MTRCL will immediately notify relevant persons. Moreover, the MTRCL's maintenance team has been conducting annual inspections of the viaducts in accordance with a vigorous system for railway infrastructure and asset maintenance and repair, inspecting the bridges and piers in detail to ensure their structural safety. As for the present case involving settlement of the viaduct piers of Yunlong Station, after the MTRCL and BD were informed about the slight settlement of the two viaduct piers in mid-2012, they met with the registered building professionals responsible for the piling works for the development project, representatives of the developer of the registered contractors together with the Geotechnical Engineer Office of the CEDD in June of the same year, requiring them to increase the frequency of measuring the settlement monitoring checkpoints and to regularly report to BDGEO and MTRCL on the readings of the settlement 
monitoring checkpoints and changes in settlement levels of the checkpoints so as to be informed promptly of the settlement situation and take necessary follow-up action. In addition, the registered structural engineer responsible for the development project also submitted a revised plan including remedial measures to BD so as to minimize the effect of piling works on the two viaduct piers. After consulting the GEO and MTLCL, the revised plan was approved by BD. Although these settlements have not exceeded the maximum tolerable limit of 20 millimeters as stipulated in the PNAP, upon the request of MTRCL, the developer of the development project voluntarily suspended the piling works in September 2013, and the situation has remained the same until now. After suspension of the piling works at the site concerned, the BD continued to closely monitor the changes in settlement levels and requested the RC to continue to monitor settlement regions of the monitoring checkpoints and submit records of settlement. During the period, the MTRCL also closely monitored the structure of the viaduct piers and the tracks and confirmed that railway safety has not been affected by the settlement of the two viaduct piers. At the same time, to further consolidate the relevant railway facilities, MTRCL submitted a proposal for preventive underpinning works for the two concrete columns to BD in October 2014. It was accepted by the BD in June 2015. As the underpinning works concern the structure of the railway facilities and involve complicated procedures, the MTRCL commissioned an independent consultant to assist in examining the implementation details of the underpinning works to ensure that the works will not affect railway safety and services and to minimize the impact to nearby residents. The underpinning works sub commenced in September 2017 and are expected to be completed by the end of the year. I like to stress that the settlement has not affected railway safety. The BD, EMSD, and MTRCL have worked in accordance with the above-mentioned mechanism to effectively monitor the safe operation of the railway system and the building works within the railway protection area. That said, in response to this incident, the various government departments, including the BD and EMSD, SD and MTRCL will review the communication and information dissemination arrangements of similar incidents in order to enhance transparency. We have reviewed information on projects within railway protection areas. According to MTRCL, there are 14 projects under monitoring because of subsidence and some of them have to do with the vicinity of heavy rails. Eight have to do with the vicinity of light rails. There have been two cases of suspension of works. One has to do with the viaduct piers of Yunlong Station, and the other one has to do with the platform of Tinping Station of the light rail. In the future, there will be enhancement of transparency in the dissemination of information. Thank you, President. Mr. Kwang Chun Yu, the Secretary has ducked the question. With regard to SCL, the Hong Kong Station, Tokowan Station, and Exhibition Center Station have all met up with problems, but they are exposed by the media before there is um, information given to the public. As you know, every day 410,000 people use the West Rail, but there has been a delay of five years without um, the incident being told the public. Did the TH Bureau know about this? And if there is a similar occurrence, how many years do you want to drag on for before you tell the public about it. I'd like to ask why did you not notify the public as soon as it happened? Secretary, thank you, Mr. Kwong, for the supplementary. According to the present mechanism, railway safety is our highest priority. There is no impact on railway safety at Yunlong Station, and the settlement is within the maximum tolerable standard. So the reporting mechanism does not stipulate that there should be reporting, but we admit that we can do better. And because of this incident, we are looking at uh, strengthening the reporting mechanism in order to increase transparency. That is why the BD, EMSD, and the MTRCL will be devising a mechanism. As I said, we are going to increase transparency, and that will be the future direction for taking forward the mechanism. Mr. Michael, look. President, well, first of all, there is a problem with the notification system, and secondly, is a problem with efficiency. You have waited five years in order to do remedial works. In 2012, 
the MTLCL and BD will we are aware of the problem, and then in 2013, suspension of works, 2014, proposing of works, 2015, approval by BD, and then two years were spent in looking into the details of the proposal, and works only started in 2017. Secretary, don't you think that there is very low efficiency and a lack of accountability on the parts of BD and MTLCL? You might be talking to the contractors behind the scenes to assign responsibility. The contractor may be unwilling, and the MTLCL was not willing to be accountable, and they were not able, uh, also not willing to take up the cost. That is why there has been such delays. Is that the case, Secretary? Thank you, Mr. Luke, for the supplementary. Here, I like to stress again: railway safety is our first priority. We did not delay the relevant remedial works. We found that there was some level of settlement, and the MTLCL was worried, and therefore there was immediate suspension of works, so as to make sure that we still put railway safety as our first priority. But the West Rail was in operation, and as I said in the principal reply, we had to consider how the underpinning works would not affect the public's use of the rail, and also there were safety considerations. That is why we needed time to inspect the proposed proposal, and the MTRCL also engaged an independent consultant in order to examine the implementation details. We have done the preparation work, and the underpinning works commenced in September last year, and they are expected to be completed by end of this year. As for the way forward, we will be increasing transparency so the public will know that we always put their safety as our first priority, and also uh, railway safety is our first priority as well. Mr. Look, which part of your supplementary is not answered? The Secretary did not tell me whether the MTLCL and the contractor discussed the issue of accountability or responsibilities. Any supplement, Se Secretary? Uh, I don't have any supplement. Maybe uh, you can ask MTLCL for more information. Dr. Chen Chong Tai. At uh, the Yunlong station, there was property development and there was settlement as a result, and the danger can be of a certain degree. Now, if the TH Bureau was aware of this incident, why is it that you never give an account, gave an account at the Legislative Council all these years? I'm not talking about telling the public, but the Legislative Council has the authority to know about the incident. Why did the Teach Bureau not inform the LegCo about this incident? Secretary. Thank you, Dr. Chang, for the supplementary. In the main reply, I mentioned that the settlement did not exceed the maximum tolerable limit. The EMSD regularly regularly inspects uh, railway safety and they did not see any point of concern and the rail was safe and the settlement was within the maximum tolerable limit so strictly speaking there was no um, issue requiring of requiring our particular attention and it is not rare for settlement to occur when there are building works therefore in terms of normal operation there was not any case for reporting because that might cause unnecessary alarm amongst the public. But we understand um, the atmosphere is for transparency to be enhanced, and we should give an account to the public and the council. We know that we can do better, and that is why the BD, the EMSD, and the MTRCL are devising a new notification mechanism in order to increase transparency. We hope we can make more information public, and also to allow the council to take us to um, be responsible, and also there would be more information for the public. Mr. Leung Chi Chang, President, this was exposed by the media. And only after that, uh, that, as the Secretary said, that in future, if there will be similar incidents, there will be a new mechanism to deal with it. The administration has in a way listened to the voices of the public, but it also goes to show that when an incident happens, the MTLCL did not make 
public the information, uh, and actually the public are rightly concerned. The settlement issue in this case has caused a mechanism to be revised, and you should embark on it without wasting any time, and you should also be accountable to the district council concerned. And then my question is whether you build the XRL or the West Rail, you have caused a lot of impact. In this case, there is settlement and the developer suspended the works. But sometimes railway projects may also have an impact on nearby housing. But the MTLCL did not suspend works. It did not take any remedial measures. My question is, will the BD seek to control relevant railway projects, including XLL, because the vibration is affecting Wai Chai Village and other housing courts? How can we bring an improvement to these matters? Which secretary will answer the question? Thank you, Mr. Leung, for the supplementary. Well, this has to do with the scope of work of the BD. Can I defer to the Under Secretary of or for Development, Mr. Liu, to answer your question? Under Secretary of the Development Bureau, Mr. President, when the MTRCL develops railway projects, we view those as private developments, and for private developments, the registered geotechnical engineer and the registered contractor and also the registered structural engineer have to make sure that the nearby buildings and structures would not be damaged or would not be negatively impacted upon. According to the BO and its subsidiary regulations, the registered structural engineer has to supply piling plans to the BD, including the details on how buildings in the vicinity will not be affected, including the setting up of monitoring checkpoints at relevant positions, and also settlement records as recorded at checkpoints, and also the acceptable limits at the checkpoints, and also contingency measures. If piling works cause settlement in nearby buildings to exceed the maximum tolerance tolerable limit, the piling works have to be suspended, and remedial and mitigation plans have to be submitted to BD, which will have to approve the plans before the building works can continue. Thank you, President. Ms. Alice Mack. President, many members asked why you did not make public the information. I don't think you can answer that. And I'm asking you how you would make public the information in future. Near the end of the reply, the secretary said that he would enhance transparency and also review communication and information dissemination for similar incidents. Of course, we don't want a recurrence of similar incidents, but if they should occur, how will you decide? how to disseminate the information and how will you decide what information should be given to the public when and when will the LegCo and district councils get to know such incidents? Secretary, thank you, Ms. Mack, for the supplementary. The way forward is to enhance transparency and also to increase the level of information dissemination. The BD, EMSD and the MTRCL are working on this. Um, we have charted the main direction forward, but um, we will be looking at a few aspects. F for example, what is the benchmark? Say if the settlement is still within the benchmark, but um, a, a warning or alertness should be given, then we will inform the public and we will communicate more with the district councils so that they will get hold of more information uh, so that we can be monitored by the council. We hope we can increase transparency and also give the public more confidence. The administration would like to increase transparency so we are monitored by the council and we would want to um, show that we always put safety first. 
Ms. Elizabeth Quatt, President. We can't just take MTRCL's word for it uh, in terms of safety. You have been quite cavalier in your attitude. You have been informing the public like peeling an onion, and the public have lost confidence in the MTRCL monitoring its railways and the administration's monitoring of the MTRCL. How can you have a reporting system that is open and transparent, and how can you allow the public to know that under what benchmark there will be information given the, to the public? It is most important to protect passenger safety. The DAB has said that you should devise a new notification system, and also you should also inform the public of the standards within that system. Are you working on it, Secretary? Thank you for Ms. Quart, uh, her question and her comment. As I said, the BD, EMSD, and MTRCL are working hard on a notification mechanism, and they will decide at what point information should be disseminated to the public. Once we have the new mechanism, we will allow the public to know of incidents in due course, and we stress transparency. But I must also stress that we still regularly um, inspect railways. It is not that we um, do not care about railway safety. And also, the MTRCL's team um, inspects the railways on a regular basis. And we also make sure that railway safety is ensured. We adopt international standards in looking at the tracks, for example. So I hope you understand that we always place railway safety in the uh, first priority, and there will be no compromise in this regard. Question two, Honorable Vincent Cheng. It has been reported that 13 rocking chairs play equipment for children located in the public housing estate were in a dilapidated state, but the government merely replaced them with the same number of new rocking chairs. Some members of the public criticized such play equipment was monotonous and uninteresting, and the spending of 2100000 on such equipment appeared to be a waste of public money. On the other hand, one of the tasks of the Commission of Children, which established by the government in May this year, was to review the designs of children's playgrounds throughout the territory with a view to making playgrounds more interesting. In this connection, would the government inform this council, one, whether it will comprehensively review and improve the designs and play equipment of the existing and newly built playgrounds, if so, of the details and the implementation timetable. Two, whether it will change the current standardized design for children's playgrounds under the Leisure and Cultural Service Department, LCSD, and the Housing Department by collecting ideas of creative designs through design competitions or public engagement exercises so as to introduce in various playgrounds, more thematic designs and special features, and play equipment which make use of various natural materials such as water and sand for a provision of sensory experience, as well as introduce play equipment which offers more challenges to children while complying with safety standards. And three, as the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child stipulate that the child has the right to engage in play recreation activities appropriate to the age of the child, and as the findings of an opinion survey conducted by a local group have shown that parents generally consider the designs of existing public playground for children have failed to cater for the intellectual and physical development needs of children of different ages. Whether the authorities or the Commission on Children will examine if the existing facilities in children's playground are able to cater for the right of the child and whether they will revise the guidelines for designing the playgrounds in the way of the details. Secretary for Home Affairs. President, the LCSC manages 640 leisure venues with outdoor children's playgrounds. A universal play concept is adopted by LCSD in planning for play equipment with a view to providing inclusive, interesting, and innovative play equipment to cater for the needs of children of different ages and abilities and their parents. To strengthen the appeal to children, Themes and popular play activities such as climbing frames, slide and swings, etc. will also be included in the playgrounds as far as possible. All the facilities have to meet the internationally recognized safety standards. In designing facilities for individual venues, LCSC and the relevant works departments will consider topographic feature, site area, and the circumstances and the views of the district council concerned, and so on. 
LCSD has been liaising with a concerned group on children's display equipment and consulting them and the district council concerned of the design and play equipment in children's playground for continuous improvement to usher in brand new design principles LCST in collaboration with the relevant works departments adopted the winning design of the inclusive play space design ideas competition as a prototype to build an innovative inclusive playground in Chinwen Park as part of a pilot scheme with the inclusion of two natural elements of water and sand in the design. Through sand, water, light and shadow, play equipment that sways and spins, climbing frames and the movable parts for knocking and touching, etc. Children can enjoy the fun while acquiring different skills, which will enhance their physical and psychological development. The inclusive playground in Chimman Park expected to open for public use in the third quarter of 2018. In addition, as a pilot plan, the workshops will be held to bring community involvement into the Kaitech Avenue Park project in Canlon City to gauge views from the children and residents of the area on the provision of play equipment in the project. Suggestions received from the public will be put into practice as far as possible in accordance with the government procurement regulations and procedures. The LCSD and the Relevant Works Department will examine and draw reference to the experience gained for the above-mentioned pilot scheme and the community involvement. Concerned groups and organizations as well as district council will be further consulted with a view to consider adopting the same approach in other suitable locations and projects. In addition to focusing on the hardware of playgrounds, LCSC also organized themed fun days in playgrounds with various organizations to encourage active participation by families in games and activities, thereby energizing public parks. Activities organized last year include uh, Storm the Park Days featuring frisbee, painting, water play, and model cars, etc., and orienteering at parks in large public parks. According to information provided by the Transport Housing Bureau, the Hong Kong Housing Authority HA will provide recreational facilities for use of different age groups, including children's playground facilities in its public rental housing estates under the concept of communal play area. For example, HA will try to integrate children's playground facilities with other facilities such as elderly fitness facilities, tai chi gardens and pavilions, etc. in the same recreation area to enable adults who need to take care of the accompanying children to use their recreational facilities together in the same area. HA has all along been adopting the pragmatic approach and fulfilling international safety standards when designing children's playground and has been selecting materials that are durable and easy to maintain. Whenever feasible, HA will also consider conduct public engagement activities to collect stakeholders' views on individual proposals of playground facilities. HA will also conduct reviews and opinion surveys one year after the flat intakes of new PRH estates. Furthermore, in order to maintain a comfortable, healthy, and safe living environment for the residents of PRH Estates, HA and the Estate Management Advisory Committee, EMAC, will from time to time gauge the views and needs of the residents and stakeholders in order to continuously improve the children's playground and other estate facilities. Where possible, HA will also replace and upgrade various kinds of playground facilities at appropriate locations. Through meetings at the EMACs, residents' representatives and other stakeholders, including the local district council members, can participate in the reviewing the need for replacing the playground facilities in the estates. HA will also consider all various factors when replacing the playground facilities, including changes in demographic structure of individuals' estate, condition of existing facilities, environmental limitations, future maintenance and repair issues in order to install suitable facilities to address the needs of the residents. As mentioned above, LCSD is committed to provide diversified play equipment in its playgrounds for children of different ages and abilities to help them attain a balanced development of mind and body, enhance their interaction with others and stimulate exploration of the surroundings through acquiring different skills by the play equipment. Most of the Children's playground under LCSD provide play equipment for a group of children aged between 2 and 5 as well as from 5 to 12.
condition. Play facilities of inclusive design are available at a number of children's playgrounds such as Corby Park and Shatin Park for the enjoyment of children with or without disabilities. Diverse types of play equipment are installed at the venues including tactile play panels and movable parts in different shapes suitable for visually impaired children, movable parts to produce sounds when knocked at, as well as transfer platform or ramps that help children using wheelchairs to use facilities and allow them to join other children in playing with these facilities. These facilities enable children with or without disabilities to play and grow up in a harmonious and happy environment and promote their physical and psychological development. LCSD will draw reference from overseas examples, bring in more community involvement and to work in close collaboration with the relevant works departments with a view to providing more innovative challenging and inclusive play equipment in playing children's playgrounds to the large public park projects and renovating the park play equipment at children's playground in major public parks to meet the needs of the children. Honorable Vincent Chang. Um, at the end of last year, I released an opinion survey with the parents' organization for the Callan West and the uh, housing estate, the playground, or rather a uh, cookie cutter approach. Most of the parents claim consider these facilities boring. I know that some of the playgrounds are uh, changing, and for some, most of the public housing estate and the old playgrounds only have contained slide and standardized. And SEC claims that besides catering their physical development, they're going to uh, consider creativity. And how would the the design of principles. Can you take reference to the foreign countries to have a longer slide and water play area so that um to make the kids happy and even the kids would like to join in to feel the confidence of the children by the UN. And on Mr. Chang's observation, um, wholesome truth and for some older facilities may need to be replaced so we will gradually uh, conduct replacement and at this stage we will need to consult the uh, residents and for new facilities, especially in larger parks. Mr. Cheng, um, as my main reply, I have pointed out that we have done a lot of replacement and improvement and which are forward looking. Look at Hong Kong Park, for example, like the longer slide example. Of course, some members uh, also point out whether you can expand the playgrounds. So we noted the members' views. On the see for the Tunman Park, on the Mr. Cheng's question of a combined natural elements such as water and sand, uh, these uh, will, can appear in parks. And before the construction, will uh, conduct consultation and hold competitions in uh, taking on board the best and most creative elements. So the park will be uh, open to the public next month and will welcome members to pay a visit to our newest park. If there are any suggestions, we are glad to take note. Mr. Kwok Wei Kyung. Thank you, President. Even though the Secretary's respond uh, mentioned that the parks will take a special approach, the uh, public will ask that for the uh, merry-go-round, um, the uh, string walls have been disappearing, and they're asking what's going on. So, uh, besides consulting the district council, the uh, bureau can consider that um, how an online voting to let the users to choose the best facilities. Just as the most popular facilities uh, will be uh, adopted to determine the features of the playground. And currently, a lot of the playgrounds that we just replaced the broken equipment. However, they lack a replacement cycle. Sometimes it will take as long as 10 to 20 years instead of uh, uh, rotating the facility every few years. Uh, please t ask your question. Um, they will uh, rotate the um, different facilities. T t can you? Uh, do some periodic uh, refreshment of the park instead of uh, doing repairs. I just responded for some of the older parks or the playgrounds that do uh, conduct a gradual replacement. So for any damages, then we'll need to uh, perform repairs right away. And for Dr. Kwok, uh, Mr. Park mentioned that some of the facilities, uh, some of them are disappearing. 
And remember something reminded that the swing frames uh, seem to be uh, diminishing in number. And I have asked the department to uh, collect the figures. For the 18 districts, there's still uh, swings on all 18 districts. At the maximum, there are like 30 of those in the same district. So they're not, not it f as visible. And for uh, uh, each district, we have their own uh, uh, needs, so it, we have to suit their respective needs as well. Mr. Uh, Stephen Ho, for the playgrounds, uh, the, uh, the facilities are boring, they should be discarded. The parents also cared when they are safe or hygienic. Recently, we read for the news. Besides um, uh, and cutting chairs and putting needles, and now they may spread to the uh, slide. And what's up there? Um, somebody have deliberately planted needles in the slides. So we asked the secretary for the maintenance and repairs. Do you have a uh, a s staff to inspect whether the playgrounds are hygienic or even uh, or have someone to check the weather the ground? Playgrounds are safe for children, and or how you feel about it, and for placing needles on the park, and how the government follow up. So, Mr. Stephen Ho uh, asked you a question. Can just take one of them, Secretary. Uh, for each of our playgrounds and park, the LCSD uh, is fully responsible, including of the safety issue raised, the hygiene, the security, and the maintenance and replacement. So uh, we have a dedicated staff performing such duties every day. Mr. al -Lohin. The LCSD playgrounds, about 98% uh, of the standalone uh, slide are below 2 meters. So not only they are not fun, they will be finished in one second, and the uh, see, rocking horses are not rocking. And a lot of uh, children's group claims that besides safety, you have to offer varying difficulty facilities uh, take uh, Okinawa for example, and it actually uh, uh, in a multi uh, composite uh, play structure with different parts. Would the board consider building hung facilities of varying difficulty to allow the children to choose to modify the guidelines? And if so, can you have a timetable for us, Secretary? For uh, we will uh, listen to the views of the public from time to time to conduct replacement or uh, come with an innovative uh, facilities. So in my main reply, I have already outlined that for new parks, there will be uh, new creative elements. As for the slides mentioned by Mr. L, some of them are rather short, and some of them are quite long as well. So uh, for the Hong Kong park case, there are have a longer slipways. Whether regardless of the distance of the um, slide, um, or some of the parents have different directions. Some of them prefer shorter. The children may prefer them longer, since with more exciting. So we have to uh, balance safety and creativity. So uh, we'll keep to that principle to cater to different age groups. Speaking of the guidelines, uh, we'll continually. Review it. If there's update we require, we shall do so. Mr. Kwang Chun Yu, the government is spending two hundred and ten thousand dollars to replace uh, thirteen rocking horses in Cheng Yi, and they couldn't be. And these horses, rocking chairs, cannot be moved. I believe that you have played on the street when you're younger, unless you have no friends. So uh, when you when you see the merry-go-rounds and the swings and so on, you hope to play in them. So um, I said it before. We have to defend the swings; they be uh, vanishing and the last thing, last thing is challenging. So you have. So what is your impression now? now uh, so uh, how to keep, make it safe and also exciting at the same time? So I'm uh, consider myself. Uh, uh, I like I like roaming in the street, and I was small. So uh, we do feel the same at this. So we hope that our children, besides um, studying school and playing electronic games, they do have more uh, physical activity in our parks. 
for the Truman Park, which have a new innovation uh, called, called climb, um, allow you to climb up and down. So um, they will have sufficient physical activity. As for the swings, and uh, I have done some uh, data collection. They all exist in 18 districts. Some of them having as many as 8, 30 of them. So the the number is subject to different interpretation. However, they do exist. If you feel that we need to have more of them, so when designing for such facilities, that we can uh, give adult consideration. Mr. Martin Liao. And children, um, the average play space for children is only 0.27 meters square, and um, the uh, wealth gap is staggering. And for the public uh, LCSD playground, the space per capita is there's a 40 percent differences of different district, and there are few companies are operating public playgrounds, and yes, to the grassroots were able to patronize the public ones. My ask the secretary, in terms of urban planning, would you consider the playground to uh, incorporate into community environment to strengthen the uh, facilities? If you so, do you have any specific plan or timetables? Thank you, Mr. Lau's views. And on the planning for community facilities, and we do have a um, of uh, numbers to adjust to reflect to. We hope to have the uh, for sufficient recreation facilities to meet the needs of various age groups. So uh, they're being implemented gradually, as there are population growth, and we should have more community. Such the facilities, and Mr. Liao understood that in the next five years, in all 18 districts, there will be uh, 26 new recreation facilities that will be taken off forward, and in the next five years, there will be 15 new recreation facilities uh, in planning. So uh, we are satisfying the public needs, Mr. Lok Chong Hong. So I'm very grateful for the response, President. A lot of the colleagues mentioned that the playground nowadays are boring. So uh, the Secretary uh, replied that we have a lot of uh, swings. And the swing can be described at the users as a diaper type swings in which you have to sit and you can't able to st stand to swing. That's different to what we have in the past. They allow you to stand on the swings. And now with a one meter tiny slides exist. Why so boring? Because uh, we've been too conservative and too safe that the uh, conventionally more exciting facilities um, have gone extinct. May I ask the Secretary, do you have any statistic in showing that the old designs are really that dangerous and more accident prone? I hope you can conduct some more scientific study, Secretary. Secretary, um, very often, when the old necessarily uh, as um, be worse off, and um, so it's not issue of is it old and new. The key, like Mr. Luke said, some would of the view that uh, it was quite boring. How do we have to uh, cater safety? So this, um, it might be a bit boring. Bit, uh, boring, so we so we have to make a compromise. So very often uh, we uh, receive some views that if the facility is too exciting or too dangerous, that uh, it might inflict harm. So we have to balance. So on one hand, we have to cater for the new ideas and more physically demanding. And on the other hand, we, uh, since the venue is public and will have any ages of any abilities. Uh, will be able to use it, so the issue of safety is uh, very important. So all, all, so and uh, to make it safe and uh, creative will be our future direction. Question three, Mr. Tong Ni Chair. Thank you, Mr. President. According to the Transport Planning and Design Menu, the bus stop spacing in urban areas should be around 400 meters, and it may need to be increased to 600 meters in the light of traffic congestions.
However, the current bus stop spacing of certain bus routes in urban areas is only 130 to 200 meters, and the frequent pickup or drop off of passengers by buses has prolonged the journeys as well as aggravated traffic congestions and air pollution. Besides, some members of the public have criticized that the bus stops are lacking facilities which are friendly to passengers and passers-by. In this connection, will the government inform this council, one, of the bus stops in urban areas with a spacing of less than 300 meters at present, and set out the details, such as the district council districts in which bus stops are situated, the bus stop spacing, as well as the names of the franchise bus companies, the bus route numbers, and the start and end points of the bus routes concerned whether the government will discuss with the franchised bus companies and members of the local communities the consolidation of bus stops that are too close to of the regulatory measures it has put in place to ensure that the balance is struck among the following considerations in the design of bus stops the generation of advertising income for franchised bus companies, the provision of a comfortable waiting environment for passengers, and the avoidance of costing construction, causing obstruction of the pavements, and three, given that the government announced in the 2016 policy address that it would allocate $80 million to subsidize franchise bus companies in installing seats and panels for a display of real-time bus arrival information at bus stops of the latest progress of such work. Secretary for Transport and Housing. Mr. President, currently around 4 million passenger trips are carried by franchise buses daily in Hong Kong, accounting for about 31% of the overall public transport patronage. rate. Therefore, the government has been encouraging franchise bus companies to enhance the bus stop facilities for the convenience of passengers and better waiting environment. My reply to the various parts of Mr. Tony Chair's question is as follows. 1. Regarding the location of bus stops, the Transport Department TD will make reference to its transport planning and design menu when considering adding, changing, or cancelling any en route bus stops. According to the menu, the ideal walking distance between two bus stops in urban areas should be within 400 metres, while the distance between en route bus stops would preferably be 400 to 600 metres. In adopting the uh, suggestions in the menu, the TD will also need to take into account a host of factors in the light of the actual circumstances. Such factors include geographical constraints, example whether the proposed bus stop is close to road junctions, Road safety, example where drivers' views will be obstructed and whether vehicular access to nearby buildings will be obstructed during passenger boarding and, lighting, and alighting. The traffic flow in the vicinity, passenger demand, adequacy of space for waiting passengers and traversing pedestrians, etc. To facilitate orderly boarding of passengers, bus routes heading to the same destinations or destinations with close proximity will be arranged to use the same or nearby en route bus stop as far as possible. In determining the suitable location of en route bus stops or individual route or a combination of routes, the TD will also take into account the service frequency and the number of passengers using that particular bus stops. Given the vast number of en route bus stops, we have not maintained information on bus stops with a spacing of less than 300 meters across the territory. Nevertheless, as mentioned above, the TD will take into account various factors on a case-by-case -case basis to determine the location of a bus stop, and the spacing between on-route bus stops will be reduced as actual needs arise. Take the section of King's Road between Island Place and Cam Hong Street as an example. Since the pavement along the eastbound section of the road is relatively narrow to cater for the heavy flow of waiting and interchanging passengers there, two en route bus stops with a spacing of approximately 140 meters are provided for diverting passengers to ensure the safety of waiting passengers and pedestrians. As for the westbound section of the King's Road, two en route bus stops with a spacing of approximately 150 meters for two daytime routes are provided to meet the needs of students commuting to school in the morning and interchanging passengers. 
All in all, when considering adding, changing or cancelling on-route bus stops, the TD will continue to make reference to the suggestions in the Transport Planning and Design Menu and make corresponding adjustments having regard to the actual traffic condition passenger demand and views of the local community so as to provide passengers with safe and convenient franchised bus services. 2. As regards the design of bus stops, under the current practice, the franchise bus companies will submit new proposed appearances for bus stops and their shelters to the Advisory Committee on the Appearance of Bridges and Associated Structures under the Highways Department for Scrutiny. The committee scrutinizes the appearances in the proposals mainly from the aesthetic, visual and grinning points of view. When vetting franchise bus companies' applications for erecting bus stops at individual locations, the TD will take into account the committee's option on the appearances of the bus stops while carefully considering such information as the locations and sizes of the proposed bus stops and the numbers of light boxes at the proposed stops. In addition, the TD will examine the potential impact of the proposed bus shelters and pedestrian flow, the sideline of other road uses, and the operation of nearby shops and will seek the views of relevant departments. The primary objective of adding shelters to bus stops is to provide passengers with a more comfortable waiting environment. The light box panel, on the other hand, is an extension of a bus shelter. The panel can be used for displaying bus service details or other information for waiting passengers' reference. In case a proposed bus stop is located in a relatively narrow area, which is not suitable for a larger shelter or one with light box panels, or that a proposed bus stop design may cause obstruction to pedestrians, the TD will request the franchise bus company concerned to change the design into more appropriate ones, such as a shorter and narrower shelter or one without light box panels, so as to adapt the bus stop to the specific environment of the pavement concerned. Franchise bus companies intending to place advertisements on light box panels are required to file an application with the TD and bear the cost of the installation and maintenance services concerned. According to the re current regulatory arrangements for franchise bus companies, revenue generated from advertising at bus shelters shall be accredited to the overall operating venue revenue of the companies. This will help relieve the pressure of fair increase. As shown from the above, when the TD processes applications for erecting bus stops from franchise bus companies, it will consider various factors so as to ensure that the bus stop design can cater to the needs of the public and the com local community, pedestrian and vehicular flows, road safety, etc., as far as possible. 3. The government has provided subsidies to franchise bus companies for installing seats at, at about 2,600 covered bus stops and funded the installation of real-time bus arrival information display panels at about 1,300 covered bus stops with electricity supply on the matching phases. It is expected that the installation works will be completed in phases in 2020. The first phase of seat installation commenced in November last year, as at the 25th of June this year, installation was completed at around 600 bus stops. As for the display panels, the first phase installation works commenced in end of March this year, as at the 25th of June 2018, around 20 bus stops were installed with display panels. The overall first phase installation works for seats and display panels at bus stops are expected to be completed in 2018, while the remaining installation works will be implemented in two phases for scheduled completion in 2019 and 2020, respectively. Thank you. Mr. Tony Chair. The installation of real-time um, ETA information at bus stops will allow waiting passengers to know when buses will arrive. But um, you have to get to the bus stops to find the information. Now, we want to promote Hong Kong as a smart city, and we talk about smart um, mobility. So has the government got any plans to provide a single platform so members of the public will have information, access to information for all modes of tra public transport in Hong Kong? So they could therefore plan the best route in terms of the um, duration and affairs involved. Secretary, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the follow-up question. Well, the government is actually um, preparing a new mobile app to provide real-time information from public transport operators. So 
passengers will be able to access such information on the app and they will have a better idea of when buses will arrive at the bus stop and so on. So we are working on this one-stop um, service mobile app. But of course, um, information uh, has to be provided by third parties and such information is the asset of bus companies. So we will see what we can do to provide information to um, facilitate public travel. Mr. Chen Kim Po. Well, um, many new rail lines will be commissioned in the near term and in future. So the uh, traveling habits of the public may change as a result. Now, this um, transport planning and design manual has been in use for many years. Would you review it? Because uh, some principles may need to be changed so we could better reflect the functions of various um, road uh, transport. Secretary. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chen Kimpo. Now, you mentioned the transport planning and design manual. The manual was um, compiled in the 1980s. We're changing times, and we've been updating the manual from time to time. The last update was in February this year. Mr. Yu Si Wing. Thank you, President. In part three of the main reply, which is said that before 2020, there will be 1,300 covered bus stops with electricity supply. And that will be fitted with um, the real-time bus arrival information display panels. So that means there is still scope for further improvement. Now, there are 2,600 covered bus stops already in Hong Kong. So that means for these covered bus stops, um, it's possible to install the uh, bus arrival information panels. Apart from the 1,300 covered bus stops in the scheme, do you have any plans to expand the scope of your scheme, and by how, uh, and to what extent? Is there any time frame on that, Secretary? Thank you, Mr. Yu Wing, for your question. It's true. We have about 2,600 covered bus stops with uh, seats and stores. But then, um, because of the geographical constraints, it may not be possible to install the um, uh, display panels. Without display panels, there is no electricity supply. Therefore, um, for these bus stops, it may not be suitable to install the uh, display panels because they don't have the light box panels. So we have to consider the actual um, operational circumstances. But then for new uh, covered bus stops, um, under the franchise agreement, the bus operators have to install seats as well as to um, build an extension of the bus shelter to provide the uh, uh, information display panels uh, on their own costs. Mr. Ronick Chen, well, the Secretary said is now um, preparing um app to cover all information on public mode transport. I think you're talking about e-transport and uh, so on. So and, uh, the, the, um, the, there are different apps to tell people which road to take if they're motorists or which um, modes of transport to, to take if they're passengers. But then actually the bus companies also have their own mobile apps uh, so the public could pick the quickest and the uh, most convenient route if they want to take public service, uh, public transport, but of course, such apps uh, are not linked up together. So one app is just for the information of one bus company, but then there, it could be the same bus route uh, operated by another bus company, and then there is no information on that. So would the government actually help the relevant um, tra op transport operators to provide instead a one-stop uh, platform, or maybe uh, you could open up? the information to third-party app developers so they could um, um, do the, provide the app or the government could provide a single stop, uh, one-stop app for the public. Secretary, I thank Mr. Chen for his views. Now, um, in Hong Kong, our situation is very different than that of other places. Uh, bus operations are privately run in Hong Kong. They're not publicly run. So information of bus companies is an um, asset of third parties. It's covered by intellectual rights protection. Right now, the government is uh, preparing a one-stop app to collate all the information. And through another 
uh, one-stop app, we could obtain real-time arrival information of all bus companies, so passengers will be able to access all the information in a single app. But it would be far better than passengers having to access different apps uh, provided by different bus companies to, to get information. Now, apart from the... Um, uh, this will also allow passengers to pick the best route, and that will help uh, traffic flow. So we will encourage bus companies to make open more data. But uh, such data are private property, so we have to work harder on this front. Dr. Chang Chong Tai. While the government subsidizes bus companies to pro to install the seats at bus stops, is a good thing. But um, if they don't do it um, properly, if they do it in a perfunctory manner, then it's counterproductive. For example, at Kwai Chung, there is a new covered bus stop. The newly installed seats are in the middle of a queue, and the seats are facing away from the roads. That means passengers won't be able to see when buses arrive, and it's also not safe uh, because they uh, their, their back is um, turned towards the uh, road, and if there's an accident, they can't um, run away quickly enough. So can they be um, more committed in what they do for the remaining um, 1,000 or so bus stops or where there will be installation of uh, seats? Or can they do it in a more professional manner, please? Secretary, thank you, Dr. Chang Chong Tai. We are aware of this uh, case. Now, the uh, franchise bus companies are responsible for the design of the seats. The uh, transport department will not uh, uh, is not involved, but uh, the transport department will discuss with other relevant government departments, and then they will lay down the conditions for the installation of seats. For example, the bus stops must first have a cover, and then the seats must be installed on the uh, supporting frames of the cover. And uh, after installation, there must still be 1.5 meters of passageway. So the transport department will make sure that uh, bus companies comply with these uh, conditions before they give approval for such installation. The transport department will also carry out on-site inspection to make sure installation is done properly before giving the subsidy to the bus companies. They will make sure that the um, um, cost of the installation are uh, finalized after the works are completed. The uh, TD will have um, will monitor such a situation, so we are aware of the case mentioned. The transport department has already asked the bus company to make improvements to, fa to um, facilitate passengers, for example, adjusting the queues, uh, the passenger queues, or providing more space uh, for passengers and so on. And also in the future, when we design such a seat, uh, and in giving approval for the design, we will be more careful. We'll hope that uh, similar incidents won't happen again. Thank you. Mr. Michael Tan. Thank you, President. My question is not in your um, script, so please give me a um, direct answer. Uh, recently, I took the bus uh, with my three-year-old granddaughter, so she knows what uh, taking the bus is about. Now, uh, we were at the Chim Sa Choi Pier, uh, and uh, we took eight, Route 8A to Wampo. That's a real-time arrival information display panel, but uh, and it was 34 degrees on that day. It was so hot, I almost fainted. And then, um, at the um, meeting of the um, Chin Wan District, Chin Wan, um, tra traffic and Transport Committee in April, I suggested um, a, a bus stop design like this. Uh, there is a Wi-Fi hotspot, there's solar panel. More, most importantly, there is a air purifying system. So it could uh, reduce 90% of the toxic substances. At the same time, the temperature of the bus stop could be adjusted. Now, there are no doors, there are no windows, but uh, the temperature could be maintained at 24 degrees Celsius through the um, 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 uh, um, vents for uh, air conditioning. So now the government is subsidizing the uh, installation of seats at 2,600 covered bus stops and information display panels, but this is something so outdated. Many other countries already have this facilities, and we're only starting to do it now. Mr. Michael Tan, please come to your question. Okay, for um, installing the seats and so on, uh, they were completed by 2020, but uh, could you start um, providing bus stops like this um, you at one or two trial spots? Now, uh, Singapore is, is already doing it, but every, Singapore is always ahead of us, so um, we, you know, we feel aggrieved. Uh, we have so much more money than they have. Can you come to your question, please? Can you pick a few trial spots before 
the uh, completion of the seat installation in 2020. Try it. This is comfortable. Mr. Michael Ten, you've already asked a question. Please take your seat. Secretary, I would like to thank Mr. Michael Ten for his question. I take the bus often because where I live uh, is uh, very easy to catch a bus, and I think uh, taking a bus is a comfortable way to travel. Now, Mr. Michael Tan talk about um, um, all weather um, covered bus stops. Yes, we are aware of such developments. Thank you for your suggestion. We'll see where we could have trial spots. Uh, but uh, we, have, we have to bear in mind in Hong Kong, uh, we have narrow roads, especially on pedestrian pavements. Uh, there are many constraints as well. In my main reply, I mentioned that in um, or already just um, determining location of bus stops is a major challenge because of the constraints we have to consider, uh, the physical constraints, that is. We have to consider pedestrian flow. We have to see um, whether there could, uh, would be any negative impacts um, for um, locating bus stops. But anyway, we will uh, bear in mind the latest development. Uh, that's why we keep updating the design menu. The whole purpose is to make sh to allow passengers to have a comfortable waiting environment. That's what we will continue to do. Thank you. Question number four, Mr. Ipinion. Mr. President, located in the Anderson Road development area, on Tad Estate, the intake of which was completed in 2016, and on Thai Estate, the intake of which will be completed within this year, can accommodate a total of 50,000 residents. While the authorities have planned to provide four kindergartens, three primary schools, and one secondary school within the development area, so far only one half-day kindergarten has been completed and commissioned. This has resulted in quite a number of newly moved-in residents scrambling for several months for places in nearby schools for their children. In this connection, will the government inform this council, one, of the authorities' projection on the population of children in the aforesaid estates, which are of ages for attending kindergartens and primary and secondary schools, the criteria adopted for planning the number of kindergartens and primary and secondary schools within the development area, the original and latest schedules for the commissioning of those school premises, and the number of places to be offered to new students at each of the levels. Two, of the specific measures to be put in place to assist the students concerned in obtaining school places pursuant to the principle of vicinity, the number of applications made by residents in the development area for change of schools for the children and the outcome of them, and three, of the reasons why the construction progress of the school premises within the development area is lagging behind, whether it will review the relevant arrangements and expedite the progress of works, if so, of the details, if not, the, sec the reasons for that. Secretary for Education. Mr. President, under the prevailing mechanism, the planning department will reserve sites for kindergarten and school development when preparing town plans and planning large-scale residential developments, having regard to the planned population intake and the basis of the needs of for community services in accordance with the guidelines set out in the Hong Kong PSG. In the process, the Education Bureau will be consulted. Where there are kindergarten premises in public housing estates available for use, the EDB will take into account the supply and demand of KG places of the areas concerned and other relevant factors and launch school allocation exercises as appropriate upon receipt of notification from the Housing Department. Relevant factors include the demand and supply of KG places in the district and the tertiary planning units concerned. School-aged children population projections, provisioning needs for existing KGs, and provision of government-owned quality KG premises to increase the number of KGs that need not charge school fees to defray rental expenses. For the four or six classroom and state KG premises at Anderson Road Development Area 2 are in Ontario Estate. One of them has already been op in operation, and the other one will commence operation in the 2018-19 school year. The remaining two premises are in Ontario Estate. According to information available to EDB, the total KG places available in the TPU which on high estate is located and its neighboring TPU are sufficient in meeting the demand of the KG student population. However, having considered the above mentioned factor on the provision of premises will launch the relevant school allocation exercises shortly. Insofar as planning of public sector primary and secondary school building projects is concerned, land is a scarce resource and construction of new school premises involve immense resources. We have to consider with prudence if adding a new operating school would commensurate with the long-term sustainable development of the district concerned so as to avoid negative impact on the steady development of the school sector as a whole. As far as reserved school sites the public housing development are concerned, EDP has to consider factors including the planned development of the area concerned 
The school age population projections, which are compiled based on the population projections updated regularly by the Census and Statistics Department, the projection of population distribution released by the Planning Department, the actual number of existing students in school places available at various levels, the prevailing education policies, other factors that may affect the supply and demand of school places, etc., in order to decide if a premises should be used for operating a new school or provisioning an existing school and to kickstart the relevant school building program. For school building project from planning to completion involve various stages. Many certainties may come into play during the process. EDB has reserved for 30 classroom school sites um, at the development area, including three for primary school and one for secondary school. The building works for one of the premises is expected to be completed by December 2018. The secondary school building project is undergoing detailed design stage and will seek funding approval as soon as practicable. As for the remaining two reserved primary school sites, we have launched an SAE in the end of 2017 to allocate one of the sites. The allocation result will likely be announced by the end of this month. We have also commenced the preliminary preparatory works for the project at the other primary school site, and we plan to launch the SAE in 2019. EDB has the responsibility of providing sufficient public sector school places for all school-aged children at present. Secondary school is planned on a territory-wide basis. Under the secondary school places allocation mechanism, netting of school places from neighboring areas will be arranged as and where necessary to ensure a stable supply of school places in each district and to provide parents with more choices. As far as Kun Tong is concerned, there are still a considerable number of secondary school places available at present. The provision of public sector primary school places is planned on a district basis. Under the primary one admission system, POA, allocation of primary one places is school net based. Under each POA cycle, the supply and demand of places in individual district school nets are subject to changes due to various factors. For example, whether parents would choose to apply for public sector schools, the number of newly arrived children, the timing of new housing estates intake, leading to possible year-on-year changes. In accordance with the consensus reached with the sector, EDP has been adopting flexible measures to increase the provision of places to meet the projected transient demand for school places so as to minimize the impact on schools when the demand subsides. Such measures include borrowing school places from neighboring school nets, using vacant classrooms to operate additional classes, operating time-limited schools in vacant school premises, and temporarily allocating more students to each P1 class, etc. On Thai State and on Tap estate are situated in school net 46 and school net 48, respectively, in Kuntong. Over the past few years, school places were borrowed from school net 46 to school net 48 in order to provide enough school places and choices in accordance with the established arrangements. Both school nets are not required to borrow school places from other districts. With the gradual intake of the public housing estates in Anderson Road development area, EDB has distributed through various channels information leaflets about schools in Kuntong and procedures about transfer of school to residents who are going to move into the district for reference. We've also been discussing with the schools concerned to make good use of their vacant school premises to cater for the needs of students newly moved into the district. For parents who wish to arrange for transfer of school for the children, they may either approach the bureau or contact the preferred school's district. In POA 2017, there were about 40 and 70 new applications for admissions to P1, including requests for change of school net due to change in residential address in late applications from new arrivals from the residents in school net 46, including Ontai Estate, and school net 48, including Ontai Estate, respectively. All the children concerned to have been allocated public sector P1 places in the district. As regards POA 2018, EDB has received 60 and 40 such places in the uh, new applications from the residents in school net 46 and school net 48 respectively during the period between the school choice making for central allocation in February 2018 and June 2018. All the applicant children concerned have been allocated public sector P1 places in the district. There are still surplus public sector P1 places in Kuntong. EDB would keep in view the situation and provide assistance to needy parents as appropriate. Regarding applications for transfer to schools, EDP has arranged 160 primary school students newly moved to Ontad or Ontai State to change the schools in the district in the 2017-18 school year. As at the end of June this year, EDP has received a total of about 200 applicants.
applications from students residing in Ontet or Ontai estate applying for transfer to P2 to P6 classes of the schools in Kuantong District in 2018-19 school year. As the situation in respect of school places available and vacant classrooms has only become clearer by early July, DDB is working with the schools concerned on the additional P2 to P6 classes to be operated and has started to inform parents of the school placement arrangements of individual levels for the children. All the students could be transferred to schools in the district for admission. As regards KGs and secondary schools, EDB has received only a few cases seeking placement assistance for the 2018-19 school year. All these cases have been handled in accordance with our prevailing practice, and applicants have been provided with information on the vacancies of KGs and secondary schools in the district. EDB will provide referral support if needed. In, su- in short, EDB has to take into account various sect- factors before initiating a school building project. Hence, the commencement of a new estate school may not be necessary tie in with the population intake schedule of the new public housing estate concerned. We continue to provide, provide necessary assistance to parents in need who would wish to seek transfer of school. School for the children. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Ip Kinyu. Mr. President, my question was very clear regarding ONTED and ONTAI estate. I ask how many students there are of school age. The President, uh, the uh, Secretary refused to answer. As I understand, there are up to 10,000 students for the 50,000 population uh, in the estate. I don't know why. He has refused to answer the question. Eight sites have been reserved but are planned for the development area, but so far one kindergarten has been completed. When the population stage has been completed, the, the problem is very serious. I want to know why. Regarding a secondary school premises, it is expected to be completed by the end of 2018, but now the site is left idle. Why aren't you um, building a school there? You are wasting resources. Please raise your question, Mr. Kinyun. My question is very simple. According to parents, one of the parents, um, the her girl will be promoted to P1 this year. But by the time the school building is completed, uh, her girl will have finished primary school. I want to know, as far as planning for schools is concerned, whether the EDB is adopting a people-based approach and whether you are letting parents and children suffer. Why can't you follow the um, intake uh, schedule as far as construction of schools is concerned? Secretary, as I explained in the main reply, and in fact, uh, today's reply is more detailed than the replies I've given in previous uh, to our previous oral questions, because it has to do with the construction of school buildings, school place allocation mechanism, as well as uh, how the EDB provides assistance to parents and children who are moving to another district on transfer of schools and uh, looking for school places. As per my main reply, in Kuantong, we have sufficient school places for our KG students as well as primary and secondary school students who have recently moved into Ontai and Ontai estate. Well, for the primary school being built at the moment or the secondary school planned uh, in the development area, places will be available for residents in Ontai and Ontai estate. But these will be for reprovisioning um, for school premises with um, not up to date facilities. We plan to reprovision the school to these areas. So basically, as far as new school places are concerned, for Ontai and Ontai estates, the problem is not serious. But of course, it may be difficult for parents to look for a school place that are really close to their that is really close to their home or that is really to their like liking but basically we have been able to fulfill the principle of a district based planning mr jeremy tam well it's really a meltdown for on Thai on tag estate the population is huge for on intake has been completed for on Thai 
um, one third of the intake has been completed. So you do have planning. You have planned for four kindergartens and four other primary and secondary schools. But at the moment, only one kg has been completed. You talked about reprovisioning and other excuses. But as far as your policy is concerned, you need to uphold the principle of vicinity. For these two estates, they live on the hill, and takes and it takes time for them to commute downhill to Kun Tong. And secretary, you should not let children take such a long journey to and from school. The question is not about lack of planning. You do have planning. The question is whether there is any administrative error, such that these schools in the pipeline are not yet in operation. What, is that the cause of the delay, or is it that it is really your policy to allow residents to move in first, and you only respond to complaints in drips and drabs? So, what part, uh, which is correct? Please explain, Secretary. About the planning procedures, I've explained that in the main reply, but perhaps let me elaborate on our planning. We base our planning on the projected population of the two estates, and then we reserved sites as to when the school building will be constructed, or whether there should be reprovisioning, or whether there should be a new school instead. We need to consider the change uh, in population before finalizing the proposal. If we make a decision prematurely, the possibility is that. For example, if we've decided to reprovision the school instead at a very early stage, and if there are substantial changes to the population of school-aged children in the area, there may not be sufficient school places, and we should instead have opted for a new school instead of reprovisioning an existing school. Uh, our policy is to put the school places First, in Kun Tong, we're able to find sufficient school places for those living in On Tai and On Tat estate. We don't base our planning on a housing estate as a unit, but uh, basically on a school net. But of course, we do allow borrowing of school places between school nets. As such, there are sufficient school places for school aged children. So if you use a housing estate as the as a unit, then it may be like what Mr Ip said that the school hasn't been completed for commissioning to serve the estate. But if you take the district or school net as a whole, there aren't su there are sufficient school places. My question was very clear. So is it a planning issue or is that a delay leading to this situation? Is it are you saying that this is part of your plan? Anything to add, Secretary? Secretary, please clip on the mic. We have the responsibility to provide school places for all school age students. And in Kun Tong, we're able to find sufficient school places for our KG, secondary, as well as primary students. Mr. Tong Yi Chair. Thank you, Mr. President. Of course, planning is good, but implementing your plan in a timely manner to provide facilities is equally important. Earlier, the government announced that a number of sites in Anderson Road development area will be converted from private uh, housing development to public housing development, so that 90% of residential uh, units there will be public housing. Now, Secretary, you may be focused on education and school premises, but have you considered, in light of the above change, whether there will be any change in demand for school places, and have you discussed with the Development Bureau on other possible facilities such as child care, elderly care facilities? I think part of your question cannot be answered by this secretary. Secretary, would you like to reply? It's true. I can only answer the parts relating to education. When there are planning changes, the impact 
on the population and on school age students will be followed up on by us. Uh, we will update the information with the planning department and we'll also update the information when preparing the projection of school age student population in the area. And based on the up to date information, we'll then plan for the use of sites or school sites of school premises in that district or neighboring districts. Mr. Wilson or Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the Anderson Road Development Area at the moment has 22 uh, p public housing blocks, 16,000 population, um, not to mention on Ted on a Thai estate with 50,000 uh, additional population. On the intake of uh, on Ted was completed in 2016. However, despite the planning for primary schools and secondary schools, some of the uh, projects are still at the funding uh, approval stage. It is undesirable, and the government has lost touch with the community. For the newly, for residents newly moving into the district, they are not familiar with the district, and they are helpless to understand the sentiment. Second, can you tell us, in terms of future planning exercise, can you give us an undertaking that? Apart from um, making the advanced works smoother, you will also expedite the provision of facilities so that we won't have a repeat of this incident in An at Anderson Road Development Area. About the planning of the Anderson Road Development Area, I have given a detailed answer. Different districts have different characteristics. For example, in Queens Hill, we have a, um, a new development where we plan for schools. We consider the planning needs. And that there are two existing school premises, the places of which have been allocated, and we are working on their design. So we're working uh, along with the uh, plan. As for Anderson Road development area, as I explained, we need to consider the student population uh, in the whole district. And in Kuantong, there are sufficient school places. Our plan, therefore, is to reprovision an existing school. And just now, I also admitted. That as far as residents living in these two estates are concerned, if they want to find a place that um, is really close to their home, the situation is not really desirable. But indeed, they can find a school place within Kuntong. Mr. Shukachun, thank you, Mr. President. Just now, the press, the uh, secretary said that a lot of school places have been identified, but according to school students, uh, according to schools. The Education Bureau is forcing schools to increase the number of students per class from 25 to 30 or from 30 to 33. Have you considered if you continue to increase class size, you will compromise the quality of teaching and learning? And the classrooms are very crowded at the moment that uh, even the classrooms cannot accommodate all the tables and chairs. Secretary. Mr. Shokachan again was referred to the Anderson Road development area. In the past few years, because of population changes, we had to implement short-term measures because um, the population changes were transient in nature. In Kuntong, for some schools, we might make use of the vacant classrooms. And we also set up some a time-limited um, school uh, using two vacant school premises and we also implement short-term measures uh, to cope with the increase in population. But these are not long-term measures. And in terms of population planning, it is long-term exercise. We therefore understand that these are short-term measures to cope with transient needs. What part of your question has been answered? I ask about on Thai, on Thai estate. I ask whether this happened to them. Secretary, I already answered in terms of increasing class size in the past few years, this has happened and it is not directly related to the intake of on take on an on Thai estate. Question number five, Dr. Helena Wong. 
On the 21st of last month, the Department of Health received a report from the Queen Mary Hospital that Enciplex, a commonly used drug for treatment of digestive disorders, was expected of having been contaminated by mold. On the following day, the supply of that drug requested all its clients to suspend the supply and sale of the drug to patients or customers, and the hospital authority also immediately ceased dispensing the drug in public hospitals. On the 26th of last month, DH endorsed the supplier's recall of all batches of the drug from the market due to a quality issue and called on members of the public to stop taking the drug. In this connection, will the government inform this council one since when the clinics under DH have ceased dispensing the drug concerned? Two, of the reasons why? Not until five days after the receipt of the report did DH call on members of the public to stop taking the drug? Whether DH has revealed if such a response was too slow, if DH has revealed an outcome is in the affirmative of the improvement measures to be put in place, and three, whether it will establish a system under which sampling checks will be conducted on imported pharmaceutical products at import wholesale and retail levels in order to better protect public health, if so, of the retails, if not the reasons for that. Secretary for Food and Health. President, in consultation with the Department of Health, I provide a reply to the three parts of the question as follows. In accordance with the Pharmacy and Poisons Regulations Cap 138A and the Code of Practice for Holder of Wholesale Dealer License, DH has to take into account various factors in exercising its powers, including the order to recall products vested in the department by the legislation and licensing conditions or before calling on the public to stop taking a registered pharmaceutical product. In general, DH is required to make a preliminary assessment as to whether the incident poses a significant public health risk and may order suppliers to record a product or call on the public to stop taking the product after obtaining the analysis results. As regards the subject incident, DH received a report from QMH on the 21st of June 2018 that a pharmaceutical product named Enciplex was suspected of having been contaminated by Monascus. DH's drug office immediately started an investigation and collected a total of 13 samples from the local suppliers, QMH and the dispensaries of DH clinics for analysis. These clinics were taken from 10 different batches of Enciplex, including two batches involved in the report made by QMH. In the afternoon on the same day, the drug office delivered all the samples to the laboratory of the Center for Health Protection for analysis. An analysis was conducted in accordance with the requirements specified by pharmacopoeias to assess, ascertain whether the product has exceeded the pharmacopoeia standards for the total mold and yeast count and the total bacterial count of non-sterile oral products. According to the pharmacopoeia methods and requirements, an analysis of the total bacterial count takes five full days, while that of the total mold and yeast count needs seven full days. On the same day, that is the 21st of June, DH made the incident public and instructed the local supplier to ask the Indonesian manufacturers of the product to conduct an investigation. On the 22nd of June, the supplier submitted to DH the results of a preliminary assessment of the drug conducted by the Indonesian manufacturer, which stated that the raw materials and the product environment met the uh, from a Copial standards of its in house specifications. However, as a precaution, the supplier asked his clients on the same day to stop supplying the drug to the public pending the completion of DH's investigation. DH clinics and the hospital authority also stopped dispensing the drug with immediate effect. The analysis of the bacterial content was completed on the afternoon of the 26th of June as scheduled. The analysis shows that all the samples compiled, complied with the pharmacopoeial standards. However, as the bacterial context was found to have exceeded the in-house specifications set by the manufacturer, the supplier recalled the relevant batches of the drug on their own initiative. 
Ditch announced the update on the same day and asked the public to stop taking the drug. Ditch clinics proactively contacted the patients concerned and called on them to stop taking the drug. DH also asked the manufacturer to conduct a further investigation based on the latest analysis results. The analysis of the total mold and yeast content was completed on the afternoon of the 28th of June as scheduled. The analysis results showed that all the samples complied with both the pharmacopoeial requirements and the in-house specifications set by the manufacturer. DH also announced the analysis results on the same day. In sum, Ditch conducted an investigation of the product in accordance with the legal requirements and made public the results in a timely manner. The 13 samples collected for the investigation complied with the pharmacopoeial requirements on the total mold and yeast count and the total bacterial count of non-sterile product, oral products. Under the Pharmacy and Poisons Ordinance, CAP 138, Pharmaceutical products must satisfy the criteria of safety, efficacy, and quality and must be registered with the Pharmacy and Poisons Board before they can be supplied in Hong Kong. For manufacturers, the most important and effective way to ensure the quality and safety of their products is to strictly comply with the Good Manufacturing Practices or GMP for medicines. As regards the pharmaceutical products registered in Hong Kong, be they locally produced or imported, their manufacturers must meet the GMP requirements of the Pharmaceutical Inspection Cooperation Scheme, or PICS. In addition, DH has an established mechanism where samples of pharmaceutical products, including Locally produced and imported products are collected from suppliers and the market for regular analysis according to risk assessment. Items for analysis include the content of the active ingredients of a product and other requirements of the pharmacopoeia, such as testing for microbiological quality and dissolution tests for tablets and sterility tests for sterile preparations on different dose forms. When a product is found to be in compliance with the relevant specifications or requirements, DH will conduct an investigation immediately and, where necessary, require the supplier to record the products and make a public announcement. The above sampling mechanism and the regulatory measures for pharmaceutical products have been working effectively over the years. Dr. Hannah Wong. President, my concern is the uh, quality assurance of imported drugs. According to the Secretary, uh, their system has been effective. However, the so-called effective uh, mechanism is uh, flawed with defects. My question is whether you have conducted any sampling checks on imported products, and the answer is no. There are 34 countries all over the world that conduct sampling checks and analysis of imported drugs, including uh, China, EU, Canada, Switzerland. There are 34 countries in total. Of course, they do not test each and every tablet, but uh, for uh, drugs imported from uh, uh, reputed and established manufacturers, they can be exempted. But you have not conducted sampling checks, and then uh, you have uh, not tested for the efficacy. You will only sample some of them by DH. Now, uh, you have uh, uh, Monica's was found in this uh, enzyplex, and a hypertension drug was found to uh, con be contaminated with uh, carcinogenic materials. So, Secretary, can you be not so arrogant? Please, don't say that the current uh, system is good enough. Are you going to reveal your sampling mechanism, and will you introduce a system where all imported products are sampled at import? Thank you. When products are imported, a DH operates a mechanism 
that is in line uh, with uh, the um, PICS requirements. Drugs will, if we all uh, drugs are sampled and tested, this will uh, slow down the import of drugs into Hong Kong and DHS to strike a balance. And the strategy for monitoring all over the world is GMP for manufacturers to ensure the quality of their products. So we require manufacturers to strictly adhere to GMP for medicines. Through such requirements, the uh, quality of uh, products will not solely rely on uh, sampling. Rather, we rely on uh, the whole uh, system personal training requirements on uh, the production lines and requirements on packaging and also verification of procedures and uh, also examination uh, quality assurance and also certification and uh, also um, follow up uh, measures after production. So we have a very stringent system. Together uh, with a sampling of pharmaceutical products we are doing, the system has uh, been uh, well established over the years. Of course, we also follow the uh, global trend in uh, the regulatory and the regulation of drugs. And a DHO will uh, draw reference from these practices. Which part of the question has not been answered, Dr. Helen Wong? I asked uh, how come the secretary doesn't conduct a sampling check of uh, all imported pharmaceutical products, but uh, she has not told us the reason why. Secretary, as I said, the regulation of uh, drugs by DH is more or less in line with international practice and uh, at import. If we uh, do sample sampling checks of all medicine, this will slow down. Can you please allow the secretary to finish first, Helena, Dr. Anna Wong? But this is the time for the secretary to reply. You have already raised your question. Please be seated first. Secretary, please continue. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Deputy, I was about to say, I want to reiterate that first, the um, regulatory system in Hong Kong is in line with international practice. Secondly, while we do not uh, conduct uh, sampling checks of drugs at import because DHS is of the view that this will slow down the import of drugs into Hong Kong. However, the most important thing is how can we have quality assurance of uh, medicines as a whole. We depend depend on the whole system and the manufacturers have to follow uh, GMP and the whole system include a training of personnel requirements of verification and examination and also uh, after production follow up so and so forth. We have very stringent requirements and supervision over these matters. We believe this is important and uh, we also um, Contact sample checks of products after they are in the market, and should there be uh, any problem, we will uh, require a record. This system has been well established. Anyway, DH will uh, follow the latest uh, global practices and trend and review our own system accordingly. Uh, doc Professor Joseph Lee, uh, Dr. Anna Wong has an, any follow up. I am afraid that after reading the two page uh, reply, I'm baffled. Now, there are three types of materials mold, yeast, and bacteria. There are three things. And according to a reply, whether they be bacteria, mold, or yeast, uh, uh, the government's uh, analysis results were okay. Whereas for the bacterial content, it uh, exceeded the in house specifications set by the manufacturer. So uh, the product was recalled. So do we have uh, two standards when I have a box of the medicine? Can I take it according to the administration? Uh, the uh, bacterial mold and yeast counts 
comply with the uh, pharmacopoeia peers. So can it be eaten? And then according to the manufacturer, it exceeds uh, my in-house specifications, so it's recalled. So uh, on what basis do you order recall? Now, if uh, the manufacturer uh, tells you uh, that uh, their in-house specifications exceeds uh, the requirements in the pharmacopoeia, and do you still require recall? And uh, do you have any uh, uh, standard, any benchmark for uh, telling uh, the public whether a certain drug should be recalled? Now, if I have a box of that medicine, I still don't know whether I should uh, take it or not. Secretary, thank you. After the investigation by the manufacturer, in fact, it has a more stringent standard. And as a precautionary measure, the uh, manufacturer decided to recall the product. So it was a recall decided by the uh, manufacturer. From DHS's point of view, of course, it will continue with its investigation. It also required the manufacturer to conduct a further investigation and submit a report to DH. And pending that, uh, the uh, product uh, will be suspended uh, from supply in Hong Kong. DH will continue uh, to look at the investigation report of the um, manufacturer in deciding whether the product should be allowed to be imported to Hong Kong again. And before uh, resuming supply, DH will uh, take samples and conduct a safety analysis and uh, the product can only be made available in the market after it is found safety and this is the usual practice of the DH in monitoring uh, drugs supplied in Hong Kong. My question has not been answered. It's very straightforward. Now even though you have double standards, uh, do you have any uh, performance pledge as to uh, the number of days it would take before announcing a recall? Secretary, well, should there be any incident uh, if it is verified, DH will make an announcement at once. And for this incident, as I said, before the investigation is completed by the manufacturer, the uh, product is suspended uh, from uh, supply in Hong Kong. Dr. Kwokaki, thank you. Enzymplex, Enziplex. I think everyone in uh, the profession uh, knows that it is not a necessary drug. It will only uh, boost your uh, digestion. On the 21st, now most arrangers, on the 21st, uh, QMH uh, made a report to DH, and it was not until five days afterwards that uh, DH called upon the public to stop taking that drug. Within that five days, uh, many people in Hong Kong were baffled as to what to do. The secretary said, uh, uh, the uh, supplier was ordered not to sell the drug. But there are people holding the drugs at home. Uh, some uh, paid uh, for them. Some uh, were prescribed by HA. So DH and Food and Health Bureau have so many doctors and nurses. What Don't, don't they know uh, that they should tell the public they should refrain from taking the drug from the Time being, so is the whole government sick, secretary? Uh, the DH uh, made an announcement to the public on the twenty-first of June, and also uh, asked the manufacturer to conduct an investigation at once. And then on the next day, that is the twenty-second of June, DH and HA uh, clinics stopped the dispensing of uh, this drug immediately. After DH has completed its uh, bacterial investigation, uh, all patients informed uh, all patients concerned uh, were informed they were asked to stop taking the drug. So whether it be DH or HA, if uh, they have patients taking the drug, uh, 
uh, when they have any problems, uh, their uh, nurse, their healthcare personnel would give them some advice. Dr. KK Kwok, your question was not answered. Yes, on the 21st to the 25th of 25th of June is a very simple question. There are so many professionals in the bureau and department. How come they could not tell patients not to take that drug? It was such a simple thing. The secretary said that the government called upon patients not to take that drug. No, no, it was not until the 25th of June. Now, if we look at the press release by the DH on the 22nd of June, that was already pointed out. Mr. Ao Nok Hin. Madam Deputy, my question is very simple. Even the manufacturer felt that the drug was problematic. It's impossible that the government should tell patients that it is okay. Even though the manufacturer found that the drug was problematic, our analysis showed that the drug was okay, so you could disregard the results. I think the administration should consider raising uh, the standards to be on par with that of the manufacturer. Secretary, thank you, Mr. Arnold Kane, for your question. On the 22nd of June, DHG issued a press release, and it was clearly pointed out that as a precaution, the supplier did not just uh, record the product. A hotline was set up for public inquiries. DH so far has not received any reports of um, problem after taking the drug. And uh, should patients uh, feel the need, they can approach a healthcare personnel for their advice. Thank you. Last question, CK, and I will reply, Ms. Oden Chow. Madam Deputy, regarding the parking arrangements at the Hong Kong port of the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge upon its commissioning, will the government inform this council? One, among the 661 private car parking spaces at Hong Kong port of the number of those which will be made available for online booking and the relevant parking fees and maximum parking time allowed. Two, of the number of vehicles which may be parked temporarily at the waiting area of Hong Kong port, how the authorities will handle prolonged occupation of the waiting area by vehicles and whether the authorities will issue warnings and fix penalty tickets to the driver's concern and tow away the vehicle's concern. And three, of the measures formulated by the authorities to deal with the situation in which a large number of vehicles need to make use of the waiting area to pick up and drop off passengers during peak travel seasons in order to avoid congestion. Secretary for Transport and Housing. Madam Deputy, the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge or HZMB is the first cross boundary land transport infrastructure project linking Hong Kong, Zhuhai, and Macau. In the course of planning the transport facilities at Hong Kong port, the government expected and encouraged the majority of travelers to use public transport, including franchise buses, green minibuses, taxis, and non franchise buses, and then take cross boundary shuttle bus at the Hong Kong port to travel to Zhuhai and Macau via the HZMB. Upon the commissioning of the HZMB, the Transport Department will strengthen public transport feeder service by introducing three new franchise bus routes and one green minibus route. Besides, there are five public car parks at the Hong Kong port, providing a total of 661 parking spaces for private cars, 25 spaces for motorcycles, 12 spaces for the disabled, 14 spaces for light goods vehicles, and 21 spaces for out-of-service taxis. The Civil Engineering and Development Department and the Planning Department are conducting a feasibility study for topside development at the artificial island where the Hong Kong port is located to explore how to optimize the land on the island for topside and underground development to facilitate commercial and other economic uses. The government will study the provision of parking spaces at the topside development to further meet the parking demand of Hong Kong residents and inbound visitors. My reply to Ms. Olden Chow's question is as follows. One, half of the various types of parking spaces in the public car park at the Hong Kong port will be available for booking. 
the operator of the car park will introduce an online booking system for motorists to make bookings before parking. To encourage booking of parking spaces by motorists, the parking fees of private cars will be $20 per hour and $160 per day, which are concessionary rates as compared with those of non-reserved parking spaces. Parking of vehicles in excess of the time reserved will be subject to an hourly fee of $40, which is a double of the fee of a reserved parking space. The length of each booking is subject to a minimum of two hours and a maximum of three days. A progressive scale of hourly parking fees will be adopted for non-reserved parking spaces to increase the turnover rate, thereby making the parking spaces available to more motorists. The fees for non-reserved parking spaces for private cars will be $20 per hour for the first two hours, $30 for the third hour, and $40 per hour starting from the fourth hour. Parking at non-reserved parking spaces is available only on an hourly basis but not daily and will cost $910 for the first 24 hours of occupation. 2. At the area adjacent to the passenger clearance building of the Hong Kong port, there are 24 pickup and drop-off spaces for franchise buses, 124 pickup and drop-off spaces for coaches including cross-boundary coaches, cross-boundary shuttle buses and domestic non-franchise buses, Six pickup and drop off spaces for green buses, 20 pickup spaces for taxis, and 20 drop off spaces for taxis and private cars. With reference to the car park arrangements for private cars at the Hong Kong airport, private cars bound for the Hong Kong port can pick up passengers at public car park number one close to the passenger clearance building. Apart from parking spaces for private cars, there will also be pickup and drop off spaces for use by private cars in car park number one. Vehicles can stay for free for no more than 30 minutes for any continuous period of three hours in the car park. The parking fee beyond the 30 minute period will be the same as the fee for parking without reservation. The drop off area for taxis and private cars outside the PCB has been designated a restricted zone permitting the setting down of passengers only. Should any vehicles stay or pick up passengers in the area, the police could take enforcement actions such as giving warning or issuing fixed penalty tickets. The vehicle's concern may be towed away if severe obstruction is caused. The TD contractor of the Hong Kong port and the public car parks will closely monitor the utilization of drop-off and pick-up areas, public car parks and nearby roads. To facilitate all the use of drop-off and pick-up facilities by non-franchise buses, the TD has put in place a booking system for non-franchise buses picking up travelers at the Hong Kong port. In addition, there will be a taxi queuing area outside the PCB to accommodate a maximum of around 220 taxis to, to ensure that no traffic obstruction will be caused by taxis waiting for passengers. Subject to the traffic condition at the Hong Kong port, the Emergency Transport Coordination Center of the TD will adopt appropriate traffic measure measures together with the police for on-the-spot traffic control and diversion to ensure smooth traffic. The TD will also liaise with public transport operators to make suitable adjustments to service frequencies to improve the traffic condition. Meanwhile, the government and MTR Corporation are exploring the possibility of increasing train frequencies of Tong Chong Line. In addition, the TD's Hong Kong e-routing website and mobile app application will provide the public with real-time traffic information at the Hong Kong port and the availability of parking spaces at the public car parks. This will help alert drivers and travelers to facilitate early journey planning, such as switching to public transport for traveling to Hong Kong port. In case the private car parking spaces are almost fully occupied, the TD will disseminate such information through message signs on major roads in districts. The government will also make continuous publicity efforts to encourage travelers to use public transport for access to the Hong Kong port. Thank you, Madam Deputy. Ms. Oden Chow. Uh, Madam Deputy. 660, 661 parking spaces are not enough. For local drivers who intend to drive to the Hong Kong port, they might turn to Tong Chong instead, and that will lead to congestion in Tong Chong. In your main reply, you said there will be further parking spaces at the topside development. I hope the government can really do something. In paragraph one of the 
main reply for non-reserved spaces. There are restrictions on the parking duration. I'd like to know how many hours it is without a limit on duration. Some drivers might decide to park their cars there for a whole week and that would affect the turnover of parking spaces. So I'd like to know the maximum duration of parking at non-reserved spaces. Secretary, thank you very much for the follow-up question. The government is conducting a study on topside development feasibility. As we mentioned in the main reply, we would explore the use of topside and underground development for parking. We acknowledge that 661 parking spaces might be too little, but as we have mentioned before, we intend to encourage visitors to use public transport to reach the Hong Kong port of HZMB. In terms of the reservation of parking spaces, the um, maximum length of parking is three days. There would be a an hourly um, fee scale of parking fees, and the first twenty four hours of occupation would cost nine hundred and ten for non reserved drivers. We believe that the reservation system would facilitate turnover of parking spaces and convenience to tourists or visitors. Mr. Yu Wing, thank you. In the second subparagraph of the main reply, there would be 124 pickup and drop off spaces for coaches, including domestic non franchise buses. As I, as I know, there are only eight spaces, respectively, for pickup and drop off for these domestic non franchise buses. And this is not enough. Very often, coaches have to um, wait for their passengers. So, for the ninth bus and beyond, a long queue might be formed. If you ask these um, coaches to um, go around and come back later, that would lead to congestion. Has the um, government assessed whether there would be confusion if there is such a high number of coaches around? If you have not conducted such assessment, how can you um, prepare for the commissioning of the Hong Kong port? Thank you very much. We have communicated with the trade and the um, frequency daily has increased substantially from 100 to 300. For drop off, no reservation is needed. So there isn't any concern that um, the drop off of passengers would lead to any congestion. We adopted a reservation system to balance the needs for the trade to pick up passengers as well as the um, necessary traffic measures. If there are a lot of um, franchise buses picking up and dropping off passengers, that would lead to confusion or inconvenience, and the reservation system can get around these issues. Mr. Yuxi Wing, which part of your question was not answered? I asked whether they conducted any tests of um, coaches creating confusion in the area. Cetri? Has the government conducted any tests? The TD and the trade have performed drills, so it is a kind of uh, it's a kind of testing arrangement. We will continue to listen to the trade, and we will continue to support the trade, Mr. Paul Chair. Good
方面呢，我哋又希望可以港珠澳大橋可以。We hope that the Hong Kong Tramway Macau Bridge would not become a white elephant, and we hope that there would be more patrons. But、um, in Hong Kong and Macau, we do not want to see、um, too much congestion for、um, 10,000 um, permits. All car permits、um, for both Hong Kong and Macau were issued, and、um, they were issued in phases. And、um, the vehicles with、um, different types of、um, licenses that amount to dozens of、um, thousands can all、um, come to the Hong Kong port. We would encourage vehicles that arrive in Hong Kong to be parked at these spaces instead of coming directly to Hong Kong. So, how would the government address these challenges? Thank you very much. For the 661 parking spaces at Hong Kong Port, they are for、um, parking by Hong Kong vehicles and.、Um, Vehicles from Macau and Zhuhai cannot be parked at the Hong Kong port. So the 661 parking spaces are for local vehicles, and the drivers would be expected to take cross-boundary shuttle bus to reach Zhuhai and Macau. Mr. Stephen Ho. And、um, the provision of.、Um, A、um, re、restriction on parking spaces has proved to be ineffective in the experience of Hong Kong. And according to the main reply, more parking spaces might be introduced at topside development in the future. In other words,、um, the government admitted that it was their fault that the city lacks parking spaces. So, in light of this incident and your past mistakes. Are you going to review the provision of parking spaces at infrastructure facilities, including the、um, inadequate parking spaces at space as,、uh, areas like Yunnan? Hong Kong's transport strategy has the railway as the backbone, so we we would、uh, the、um, public transport as its backbone. So we would encourage the public to use public transport. When we designed the Hong Kong port of HZMB, the the idea was to encourage passengers to use public transport, and as such, not a lot of parking spaces were earmarked, especially compared with Macau and Zhuhai. So through this study, we want to study the use of topside and underground development for other uses. Mr. Oden Chow. Madam Deputy, the secretary told us that for non-reserved parking spaces, there is no limit on the parking duration. So, in other words, drivers who pay nine hundred and ten dollars per day can park their car all day. This is just unfathomable because you wanted to. Increase turnover, but for no, for non-reserved parking spaces, you only have to pay nine hundred and ten dollars to park your car there all day. I do not agree with this approach. Would the secretary review this measure? Secretary, thank you for the follow-up question. As we said,、um, for non-reserved parking spaces, the fee would be a deterrent. For the first hour, the fee would be twenty dollars, and the se same for the second hour, thirty dollars for the third hour, and forty dollars starting from the fourth hour. If a driver parks their vehicle for three days, 
they would have to pay two thousand eight hundred thirty dollars. So the um, difference compared with a reserved space is more than two thousand dollars. The fees would be a major um, deterrent to to discourage drivers from occupying the spaces for a long time. You can make a re reservation days ahead of the day you arrive, and that would facilitate parking at Hong Kong Port. If um, some drivers are willing to pay such exorbitant fees, it's their choice. But we are confident that high hourly fees would be adequate, and we have struck a balance between the needs of drivers and the management of the car parks, Mr. Gary Fan. The question mentioned the number of um, parking spaces for online booking and that the reservation system should also apply to franchise buses. Last week we discussed smart city development at the council meeting and I asked why um, information technology is not deployed. And this is something you have covered in your main reply. So for the um, real time traffic information, would, does it only apply to public car parks and non franchise buses? What about parking spaces for green minibuses and taxi queuing areas at these spots can real time traffic information be provided to passengers so that they can make a better use of IT to save time. Satri. Thank you very much. For real time traffic data we hope to provide more information to drivers to facilitate planning and give them more options. Drivers might pass by certain um, main routes before they reach the artificial island. If they only realize that the parking the, the car park is full after they arrive, their travel plans might be affected. So as we said in our main reply, we would put up displays at main routes and before drivers set off they can use a mobile app to learn about the traffic conditions and they can choose whether to drive or take public transport. Our app can provide real time data and by the time they um or the or the drivers arrive at the Hong Kong port there would be display panels to reflect the information and this would facilitate drivers as well. This is the end of the last question.